Welcome to the Littoral Zone. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. The Littoral Zone is dedicated to helping you improve your still water skills and knowledge so you can enjoy more success and ultimately more enjoyment the next time you're out on the water. Well, before we get started on today's podcast, I'm going to answer a question I received. And uh, you, anybody who out there has got any still water specific questions, please send them along to my email, flycraft at shaw.ca. And I'm more than happy to answer them directly, of course. And uh, we'll also feature them on um, this podcast. So as I'm quite sure others may have this question or could benefit from uh, from the answer. So uh, Robert emailed me and he was asking why <clears throat> on some of the leeches on my YouTube channel do I occasionally use uh, wire or uh, most often tying thread and what influences that decision um, for some of my leech patterns. This is a, a favorite thing I like to do and and sometimes frankly I'll use thread uh, tying loops, uh, thread dubbing loops for my flies when I'm in a bit of a rush and uh, need to get going and it's just probably the way I uh, used the dubbing loop bodies uh, is with a thread base for the majority of my uh, leech patterns and other patterns but there are times I do use wire and first of all when you make any kind of wire uh, dubbing brush you certainly add a, a heck of a lot of reinforcement and durability to your flies because that wire just twists right and envelops and twists the dubbing nice and tight and is super durable and is going to take a, a really good chewing before it starts to show any sign of wear or tear from uh, catching too many fish, which is, I know, a problem uh, we all struggle with. Um, but the other reason, too, is sometimes I'll also use a, a contrasting or complementary color of wire um, with the dubbing um, because once that dubbing gets wet and if I don't dub the fly too uh, with too much material, too dense, um, that that wire base is going to shine through and just add a little element of attraction, flash, a little difference, uh, just to stand out in the water and make my fly just that more appealing. So I experiment with it all the time. Uh, red wire, um, usually in the small sizes, you use UTC a lot because it's soft and uh, it doesn't... Uh, uh, run the risk of breaking if you twist it too tight, but uh, uh, gold certainly, copper, red, blues, purples, uh, there's so many good wire colors out there, the combinations are uh, can be and are literally endless. So I encourage you to use, um, to experiment with wire-based dubbing brushes. I think you'll find the results uh, quite appealing and obviously adding that element of durability to your fly, but there's nothing wrong with thread-based dubbing loops as well. So uh, a lot of times it's just my particular mood at the time or the effect I'm trying to create. So hopefully that helps explain why I'm not always consistent with thread-based dubbing loops and occasionally throw those uh, twisted wire loops in there making dubbing brushes as well. So thanks again for that question, Robert, and I hope that helps everybody out. And again, if you've got any questions all about still water fly fishing or fly fishing in general for that matter, reach out to me at flycraft at shaw.ca and uh, hopefully we can feature one of your questions on an upcoming episode. So let's get on to today's episode. It's only fitting that my first guest on this podcast is none other than good friend, still water addict, and fisheries biologist, Brian Chan. Brian is a mentor, a business partner. Together we provide on the water still water schools and seminars, and we also produced our Conquering Coronamids DVD. We're also gonna be expanding into online learning, but we'll have more about that at the end of this podcast, so be sure to stick around for all the details. And best of all, Brian is a good friend. We've known each other and fished together for a long time, probably more than we care to admit. Let's welcome Brian. Well, Brian, it's uh, this is my first live podcast, and it seems only appropriate that I do it with you because we've known each other for so many years and spent so much time on the water together and done so many other things. And I'm sure most of my listeners have heard of you before, but for the rare few that haven't, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I live in uh, Kamloops in the southern interior uh, region of British Columbia. It's a still water fly fishing mecca with hundreds of great uh, productive small trout lakes. And, uh, you know, I've lived here for almost, well, almost 40 years, uh, having a professional career as the uh, senior fisheries biologist here and specializing in uh, the management of small trout lakes uh, for the provincial government. So that was kind of my working career here. Um, prior to that, uh, I was uh, born and raised in Vancouver, BC, down at the coast and uh, introduced to uh, fishing at an extremely young age by my very 
hardened angler dad, uh, who was an avid uh, saltwater salmon fisherman. So I got uh, literally got hooked on fishing at a very young age and uh, was gradually introduced to uh, fly fishing, which uh, really uh, piqued my interest, mainly, I think, because I didn't have to get up at 3.30 in the morning to get out on the water at daylight, uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, and, uh, you know, having the opportunity to uh, get some post-secondary education, a university degree in in uh, freshwater uh, biology, ecology, uh, and then to get the dream job uh, allowed me to really focus my uh, angling career on uh, fishing these uh, productive lakes uh, that we find throughout Western North America. And dur in doing so, you know, became a fly uh, designer along with yourself, uh, we, as we both are with Montana Fly Company. Um, I've done, I do some guiding. I uh, have done guiding for about 14 years now. And then um, I've been fortunate to, to, uh, to be a um, ambassador for a number of uh, fly fishing uh, manufacturers and boats and motors, things like that. And so it's, it's kind of all dovetailed together my career working as a biologist and also my other career as a, uh, as a fisheries uh, fly fishing uh, educator. Well, that's, that's great, Brian. And I always look back and when you were managing region three and always thought to myself, what a dream job you're again, I said this to you a few times, but you were the Fox in charge of the hen house. Cause you got to <laughs> look at lakes for their ability to uh, produce fish and uh, you got to stock them and manage them. And uh, you know, I think the world's thankful for the work you did uh, when you had that position, but you know, it, it also got us uh, yourself and myself introduced to uh, one of our favorite food sources we're going to talk to about tonight, and that's uh, something near and dear to our heart, our coronamids, or midges to the river and stream fly fisher, or over in the UK, buzzers. Um, and it's a pretty all-consuming topic. I think we're we're just going to be able to touch upon the surface a little bit, um, but we'll have some more discussion about that and how people can perhaps pick up some more information at the end of this podcast. So please stick around, and uh, despite all the, the great information you're going to have here, we're going to have something uh, to tell you everybody about uh, in regards to coronamids. So, so Brian, coronamids, why are they so important? You know, it uh, it boils down to the fact, Phil, that uh, coronamids are the most abundant species diversity-wise in lakes and also have probably the, the, the most intense and prolonged hatches in lakes. So you've got many, many species. Uh, to go along with huge emergencies that happen anytime after the ice comes off. And although the peak emergencies are in the spring and early summer months, there's chronomids literally hatching almost every day of the open water season. And when I, when I speak about prolific numbers, uh, there's been over 2,500 species of chronomids identified living in fresh waters in uh, North America, so that's um, rivers and lakes, but by far still waters and, and in more importantly, small productive still waters uh, are home to the most abundant uh, numbers of species of coronamids or midges. And uh, for the fish, not only are they an easy food source uh, to feed on and an abundant food source, they're extremely rich in calories, so there's a lot of nutrition associated with uh, heavily feeding on chronomids. Yeah, and it's I think it's surprising because most people view them as a small food source, but you and I, and especially with the lakes you've got around your in your backyard, just some pretty big fish that feed on chronomids uh, in in various stages of their life, right? You know, the the biggest fish in the lake will eat the smallest food sources. And one of the smaller food sources are those small chronomids that do come off all our lakes. But it's simply because there's so many of them and they're such an easy food source to feed on that uh, the fish and they can feed on the larval stage, the pupil stage and the adult stage. So they get three kicks of the cat, so to speak. Well, let's let's talk about the stages, because I think sometimes people say chronomids and they perhaps only think it's the pupil stage, but it's 
it's an all-encompassing life cycle, isn't it? So why don't we walk through the life cycle uh, of the coronamid, uh, what its characteristics are and uh, its importance, and we'll relate that uh, a little bit after and into some of the methods we use to uh, imitate them and catch fish. You bet. So uh, coronamids have a complete life cycle, just like caddis flies in lakes have a complete life cycle. So coronamids have an egg, larval, pupil, and adult stage. The, uh, the three latter stages, larva, pupa, and adult, are fed on by fish. So the, the way the life cycle goes is um, the returning females laden with fertilized eggs come back to the lake in the late evening hours or early morning hours, and they basically skim across the surface of the lake with the tip of their abdomen in the surface film and they create a V wake. And as they're skimming across the surface, they're releasing eggs and these eggs sink. And they eventually get to the bottom of the lake and within a couple of weeks will hatch into a very tiny chronomid larva, which looks like a segmented, uh, slightly flattened worm. Um, and these larvae settle in the mud water interface at the bottom of the lake. And they could be at the bottom of the lake in five feet of water and 25 feet of water or 85 feet of water. And the larvae then um, uh, continue to grow and they build a little larval case that they live in. Uh, and they it's placed right at the uh, right at the bottom of the lake, but protruding out into the into the water. And they pop their heads out and they feed on passing detritus, decomposing plant matter. And so they graze on that decomposing plant matter while they're in those larval tubes. So we're talking about larvae that, that could be, you know, an eighth of an inch in length, or it could be almost an inch in length, all depending on the species. So the larvae, typically have a one-year life cycle. They spend one year in the larval stage, although there are some uh, species, particularly these big bomber chronomids, the very large ones, um, will, the larval stage will uh, last uh, for two years. So typically one-year larval stage. And so the following spring, uh, that larva will have fully matured and it'll seal itself inside that old uh, larval tube at the bottom of the lake and transform or metamorphose into the pupil stage inside that tube at the bottom of the lake in five feet, in 85 feet of water and everything in between. It takes a couple of weeks, up to a couple of weeks for the pupa to, to transition to the pupa stage to be fully uh, completed. Um, and when it is completed, the pupa uh, breaks out of the old larval case and uh, then begins an ascent to the surface of the lake. And so the pupa traps or builds up gas on the underside of its cuticle or outer shell casing. And uh, that gas, which makes the uh, pupa appear quite silvery, or shiny in appearance helps to elevate that pupa to the surface of the lake. So they don't physically swim around and wiggle and uh, swim, they, they rise vertically. But as they get closer to the surface of the lake, the pupa will become quite, quite a bit more active wiggling around as, as, it's, as it's getting ready to emerge into the adult stage. So once the pupa reaches the surface film, Almost instantaneously, a split forms on the back of the pupil shock, and the adult stage will crawl out of that old pupa stage. So it's amazing transformation into a fully formed adult in a matter of two or three seconds. It's very, very quick. And the adults then sit on the water uh, for seconds. It's definitely not a long time. And then they fly off to shore to the riparian area and where the males and females will mate within about 24 hours after 
emerging as adults. Both male and female adults don't feed, so they both have a relatively short lifespan and their sole purpose is uh, reproduction. And, and then the females, again, come back to the lake and release their fertilized eggs. And that completes uh, the cycle. So it, it's, uh, again, a complete life cycle. The key points are that uh, the larva is living in a tube at the bottom of the lake. The pupa, when they emerge, uh, elevate or rise to the surface of the lake. So if this emergence is occurring in 60 feet of water, it, it would take several minutes, if not more, for those pupa to get to the surface of the lake. So quite often, when the pupa first come up out of the old larval shock, they'll suspend uh, at the bottom of the lake for several days, uh, just finishing up the final transformation. And at that time, the pupa are quite dull in color. We call them dull chronomate pupa. Uh, but as they build up their gas, then they become quite silvery. And so we know that the trout often like to feed on the dull pupa prior to feeding on the gassed up pupa. Um, and so that's why we have to have both types of uh, patterns tied up. So that's the life cycle uh, in a nutshell. And uh, Again, the majority, well, 99% of their life is in the larval stage. And from there on, in, emerging into the pupa and the doubt all happens very quickly. So, Brian, what percentage um, would you say, tell our listeners to concentrate on versus the adult stage, the pupil stage, and the larval stage? As anglers, and and I would think it's the it's same as what the trout are doing, that uh, the pupil stage probably makes up. 70% of their diet when they're feeding on chronomids. And maybe the larva could be another 20%. And then the last 10% would be the ad feeding on the adults. And the, and the reason why in our area, uh, adult feeding is, is not extensive, because I know in, in some southern states, uh, particularly western states, um, the, the fish do go on the adults. But up here, they can gorge on the larva and the pupa at the bottom of the lake and avoid predation from the, the predators of trout like ospreys and loons or, 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 or other uh, birds of prey that might feed on them. So it's just safer for them to feed on the larva and the pupa and they don't have to chase, chase them around, they don't have to chase an adult that's skimming across the surface of the lake. Oh, it's pretty easy eating, isn't it, right? They can just vacuum those larva right out of their tubes, or if the lar larva is disturbed due to circulation currents or wind activity, they can quickly, because those larvae are helpless when they're in the water, aren't they? They just writhe around and hope to sink back to the bottom. Exactly, exactly. And then, of course, you've got your pupa going through as a term I <laughs> I, I picked up yeah. from you, the death zone, which is that stretch, <laughs> that stretch of water from the bottom to the surface. But as you mentioned, so much, they concentrate their time in that one to three feet off the bottom most of the time, because it's it's about as easy a feeding as you can get. They're just like whale sharks down there, just cruising along leisurely and hailing uh, hundreds, if not thousands of coronamid pupa uh, at any one time. It's just incredible, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, no, it, I mean, there's just so many of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them. And, 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 and yeah, we have to remember that trout are, you know, they're thinking about um, expending the least amount of energy for the greatest return in food and calories. And there is nothing easier in lakes to feed on. Well, the two easiest food sources are, are chronomid pupa and uh, zooplankton mm. because they're, they're not fleeing food sources. So they're uh, just sitting there ready to be basically filter fed, just breathe them, filter them through their gills and gill filaments and down the hatch they go. <laughs> in large numbers. And this is important because your background as a biologist and and, uh, you know, leads us to, same as me, approach this from a, a scientific nature on how we uh, present these, our flies, um, using a variety of techniques based on our understanding of these life cycles, right? Absolutely. It's all, it's so critical for the still water angler and any ang river angler, doesn't matter, or even a tropical saltwater angler to understand the life cycles uh, and the and the habitat requirements of the food sources that those fish are feeding on. And for us in lakes, it's so important to understand 
how a damselfly emerges, how a mayfly nymph, what angle it swims on up to the surface of the lake, uh, things like that. And with the chronomids, it's it's understanding that they stage at the bottom of the lake as newly emerged pupa before rising. Uh, then they rise vertically up through the water. They're they're not trying to to swim away from fish that are feeding on them, and that they're an extremely abundant hatch when they do it when it does occur. Okay, so most people I think today. Uh, when they're fishing chironomids, think about a floating line and a strike indicator, and that's one method. But why don't we go through uh, all the different methods using floating lines uh, and, and sinking lines and some of the techniques we use and taking uh, with an asterisk beside these that each one of these could be an episode unto itself because uh, they're quite uh, complex at times. So why don't we just sort of touch the tip of the iceberg, if we will, and just walk through um, the different techniques using floating lines and sinking lines for all the stages. Well, as you mentioned, Phil, many anglers are under the um, misconception that it, all you need to fish chronomids is uh, a floating line. Uh, and that, you know, floating line is an essential line, but we also need to use a variety of sinking lines uh, simply because we have to remember that chronomids can come off in shallow water as well as very deep water. Um, so we always have to keep that in mind. But with floating lines, no question, we can do a lot of chronomid fishing. And that, that means a floating line uh, with a strike indicator, where, where we're, which allows us to spend a pattern or patterns as close to the bottom as we like in a very exact, precise depth. And then we can also fish a floating line, long sinking leader, which we call naked fishing. And uh, that that is the uh, w one of the more traditional ways, and it was the very popular way of fishing chronomid pupa patterns prior to the arrival of strike indicators, which came on the scene in in in, in our part of the world in the late 70s, early uh, 1980s. So prior to that, no indicators. We would use floating lines, long leaders, uh, and the naked presentation. But with the advent of strike indicators, it was a tool that perfectly fit with presentation techniques for fishing chronomids. And since then, we, we, we now use indicators to fish a whole variety of different food sources uh, can be fished extremely well under indicators. And especially now with, with the, uh, the advent of uh, balanced flies, balanced leeches, balanced stems of flies, uh, mayflies, shrimp. It, it, it even further expands the use of uh, indicators. But with, with chronomids, that's where it all started, suspending either chronomid larval patterns right on the bottom, you know, within a foot of the bottom, or chronomid pupil patterns, typically within a couple feet of the bottom, um, but always being willing to experiment to move higher in the water column if the fish that particular day or with the light conditions or the depth you're fishing happen to want to eat the, those uh, pupa just slightly higher in the water column. So we do need to be prepared to move up in the water column if we're not uh, getting fish on our patterns uh, close to the bottom. But the naked line technique with a long leader that's 25% longer than the depth we're fishing allows us to fish a pattern, cast it out as far as we can, and then allow time for that pupil pattern to sink right close to the bottom before we initiate a very slow hand twist retrieve. And that that slow horizontal retrieve is bringing that chronomid pupa through the potential feeding zone that the trout are feeding on. And unlike most chronomid takes on when using an indicator, which are often very subtle, the take when you're fishing and retrieving a pupil pattern is pretty aggressive and you'll you'll develop, definitely feel you're getting a bite because now the fish are feeding on a food source that's trying to get away from them uh, versus uh, a suspended chronomid pupil pattern on an indicator is static and they just lazily swim up to it and inhale it and try to uh, swallow it. When I first started was the floating line, long leader naked technique because indicators weren't around. And it was a 
definitely a time served method. You had to play around with your leader length. And we didn't even have bead head patterns back then. We just had to, the natural weight of the pattern. So some days our patterns, I'm sure, weren't getting down because we couldn't weight them enough. If we did weight them, they looked unnatural and fat, uh, overdressed. Um, you know, we had to master that retrieve. And and uh, although we did feel some takes, there was always that time when they were taken very softly as well. And you just see the line move. So um, I sort of envy those people with the strike indicators today and learning that way. But Exactly. But the naked technique, I think we both agree, is something that every fly fisher, every stillwater fly fisher should, should learn because it has so many other benefits besides just being a great method to catch fish. Absolutely. It, it's so applicable uh, to a lot of other food sources as well. Yeah. But we can't do all our chronomet fishing with floating lines. We we have hatches occurring in deeper water. So once we start seeing hatches occurring in, you know, 18 to 20 feet and beyond, and we, we do see a lot of hatches happening or emergencies happening in 25 to 40 feet of water, that's when our sinking line, our selection of sinking lines become an, a very important tool because we can use the sinking line depending on its density, to get down, to get our fly down or flies down to the bottom. And then we can retrieve that fly or the a combination of flies up on a gradual angle to the surface of the lake so that our chronomet pupil patterns, again, are passing through all the potential feeding zones that the fish may be focused on. So just like fishing naked with the floating line, the takes when we're retrieving a chronomet using type uh, a, a clear intermediate line, uh, type three, a type four, type five, a uh, full sinking line. They're they're hard poles. They're again because they're chasing a food source that's trying to escape from them. So uh, what, again, once we get beyond that 18 to 20 foot depth, that's when we're looking at using the sinking lines to get our pupil patterns down to the bottom so that then when then we can initiate a slow but continuous hand twist retrieve uh and this is where patience really comes in again we want that nice slow gradual arc as that fly swings up to the surface of the lake but what happens when we're fishing on the lake and we see third week of June and we're, we're going across the lake and we see all these pupil shocks and it's 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 50 feet in depth and we look on our sounder and we know there's something happening because the fish are down there so this is when we use our full sinking lines in type six type seven so six or seven inches per second because we want to use that full sinking line that very fast sinking line to present our chronomet pupil patterns vertically, straight up and down. And uh, we, we, the whole gist of this technique is to use the line to suspend our pupil pattern a foot off the bottom and uh, let it sit there. And we call this dangling or deep lining. And uh, we're holding onto that rod for dear life or we're putting it in a rod holder uh, because the, the, the takes when you dangle are bending the rod in half and, and yanking it out of the boat. So it's an ex extremely exciting way to fish. It doesn't involve much casting, but it is, it's, it can be an extremely effective way to fish. And really the only way to, to, to fish the chronic pupil patterns that are coming off in such deep water. Yeah, it is addictive, isn't it? I think we, we both done schools together and we always have to start our students with strike indicators and maybe let them have a try at at um, the naked technique and maybe some slow sinking lines because if we went straight to dangling and they caught fish on that i don't think they would listen to us about any other <laughs> method because um you know with all the other methods is you know we talked about the naked technique and you know have, developing the touch and, and learning to play with all the variables that, that method involves or you know just staring at an indicator when you dangle you can stare into space you can count birds <laughs> and trees you can do all kinds of things, but as you said, you do not let go of that rod because those takes are savage. It's unbelievable how hard a, a trout can take such a small, uh, slender fly when they take it on the dangle. But boy, they they just clock it, don't they? Yeah, you you know, you and I have taken many new anglers out and introduced them to dangling. 
and we I don't think neither either of us have ever had a guest in the boats that said, nah, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all like, can we do that again? Like, uh, I don't want to do this other <laughs> stuff. So, um, but you also learned, you touched on slow sinking lines and that's how you, your mentor, Jack Shaw, fished uh, Coronamids and Lakes, didn't he? Yeah, well, you know, my, I was fortunate to have a great mentor in Jack, uh, who pi- who was the pioneering uh, uh, source of uh, uh, of chronomid fishing in British Columbia and using imitative uh, patterns, uh, a lot of imitative patterns for a variety of different food sources. He loved to fish slightly deeper water uh, with sinking lines, and and back then we had type two sinking lines, which were his favorite sinking line and we'd often be anchored in 18 19 20 21 feet of water casting it out as far as you can waiting for the line to sink and then starting that slow patient hand twist retrieve and it was absolutely deadly and uh i can still vividly remember watching doing this with them out in the on our boats just catching fish after fish and People going by just shaking their heads and couldn't understand what we're doing um, sitting out there. And so this is, you know, going back into the mid 1970s, early 1970s. So uh, back then, uh, yeah, I I just keep thinking what if we had the knowledge we have now to have gone back then, uh, how how much better even the Cronmet fishing would have been. No, because I've had good, such good, I've had good success with that using, as you mentioned, the slow sinkers, hovers, clear intermediates, line, it sinks at one, two inches, maybe a type three, around three inches. And every time I do it, that take, and it's such a rewarding method. It makes me wonder why we don't do it more often, because it's still a proven technique um, today as, as it was back then. You know, it just, it just, for, for us, it confirms we figured it out. And, and that's that's the reward is, is catching some fish and you've figured them out. <laughs> yeah, well, this is and coronamids are the ultimate puzzle out there, aren't they? They're, there's lots of variables, lots of little pieces. Um, you don't necessarily have the box top, so you're not really sure what it's supposed to look like. But when you put it together, it's such a rewarding experience that it, it soon gets in your blood and it's very, very addictive. There's some other things we need to think about when we're fishing. You know, whether we're fishing floating lines, sinking lines, whether we're fishing adults on the surface with just sort of traditional, um, like you would on a river and stream, obviously just cast out to the rising fisher where you suspect there would be. But most of we're we're doing this 99% of the time from an anchored position, correct? Absolutely. We're, we need to be in a fixed position. So that means if we're fishing out of a boat, double anchoring it, one out the front, one out the back. If you're in a pontoon boat, you should have one out the back and one one out to one of the D rings on one of the on the pontoons. And if you're in a float tube, at least have an anchor out the back so that you're not moving. Um, and this is critical because we need to have and maintain complete control of our retrieves, um, whether they're with a floating line or with a, a variety of sinking lines. We can have that both swinging back and forth and pulling on our line and creating more movement in the pattern that needs to be. And if it's too much movement, the fish will not bite. It's just too unnatural. So even with when we're fishing indicators, we want to make sure that our floating line isn't being pushed around back and forth. Um, and again, there is nothing more frustrating than two people fishing out of a 12 or 14 foot car top or john boat with only one anchor and a variable wind direction and the boat is swimming back and forth and it just ends up being a very frustrating day for both anglers in the boat yeah it's uh, incredibly frustrating because you spend more time fighting the boat and dealing with that than you do fishing so you're you're not paying attention to the things you do and like you said your fly is just not your presentation is just not not doing what it should and your fly isn't performing and you're not catching fish. So another thing we get to benefit from modern fly fishing today is the use of electronics. And they're pretty critical in still water fly fishing in general, but especially when we're fishing coronamids, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a depth sounder slash fish finder is a critical piece of your still water kit bag. Um, even an inexpensive one uh, will be of value because 
not only will they tell you the depth you're in and also help you to check out where the where the drop offs where sunken islands are and the like but they'll mark fish and they take the fish id off and so you're looking for arches on your sounder and it'll mark fish so when you're when you're putting across the lake and you you see a a whole pile of fish suspended one to two feet off the bottom of the lake and it's 31 feet deep and you look on the surface film and there's shucks of chronomids well you know what those fish are doing down at 31 30 feet uh, below the surface they're feeding on uh, the larva are most likely the pupa and uh, that's when you then get your anchors out put your two anchors down and then because you're in that depth zone, you know you're going to be fishing a sinking line uh, of some density. And so all that information comes to you because you've you've seen the fish on the sounder and the sounders told you the depth you're in. And, and so an extremely valuable uh, piece of equipment that every, every still water angler should have in their boat, in their pontoon boat, in their float tube. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. Years ago, when we first started using them, we kind of all snuck around and hid them. And now it's uh, you know, flash for, fast forward twenty years or so. Um, if you don't have one, you're kind of not really in the game as much as you should be or could be. So another piece of equipment and used correctly is a throat pump, isn't it, Brian? Because that that tool has had such an influence um, on our ability to better understand the life cycle of the chronomid and our patterns to imitate the various stages, hasn't it? Throw pumps are another essential piece of equipment for sure, because we can use them to, to, to sample live food items. The last few few items that the fish has got in his back of his esophagus uh, at, to the end, and towards the entrance to his gullet. And so we're sampling live food sources using a non-lethal sampling technique. The fish stays in the water, it's in your net, you turn them upside down, you use a proper technique, he swims away, all we've done is removed a bit of his lunch. And then now, now we've got live samples in our vial and we can look at, first of all, are they chronomids, are they maize, are they, are they uh, juvenile uh, leeches, dams of flies, zooplankton, but for us, for chronomids, it they tell us size and color. And then we can fine tune our patterns. And the thing we have to keep in mind always is that during heavy chronomid hatches, there can be several different sizes and colors coming off over the period of five to seven hours during the day. And those fish will switch from one size and color to another. Um, and you may not notice that switch by seeing the adults on the surface of the lake or even the cast uh, shucks of the pupa. So the throat pump tells you that there's been a change from eating 16 mint green chronomids to a 14 uh, amber colored chronomid, or which off, this often happens, they've been feeding on chronomid pupa all morning, and you do an early afternoon throat pump, and they've got mature mayfly nymphs in their, uh, in their esophagus, and those fish are switching to mayfly nymphs. Yeah, because you could think you're having great fishing over that period, and then all of a sudden it shuts down. You think they've stopped feeding, and you sort of quit for the day or move on somewhere else, and, and you were still sitting over feeding fish, and that throat pump will help you stay in touch with the fish's feeding cycles throughout the day. I think we've covered a lot in, in a very short amount of time. I think we've been chatting just under 45 minutes now, and we've literally just dipped our toes in this chronomid pond, haven't we? There's a a lot of water to explore and a lot of things to learn about chironomids. For you and I, it's been a lifetime commitment that uh, we're still learning, right? Every time we go out, we learn something new. Um, and we, we just probably, we can't adequately cover it. Each one of the things we've talked about is is an episode unto itself. And I mentioned in the opening, um, if, you, if uh, listeners would stick around, um, we hopefully, Brian and I have whetted your appetite, making you wanna learn more about chironomids more about chronomid techniques and fishing to uh, so you can try that on your local waters and improve your still water fishing. So Brian and I have got together, as we mentioned, we've done lots of courses together. Um, we've done a two volume DVD set together. We've uh, done still water schools together, but we're going to do first for us, and that's an online chronomid course, isn't it, Brian? 
Yeah, we're going to try um, an online course, including uh, 11 sessions, all online, uh, uh, with uh, the last uh, with two sessions that uh, we're each tying our uh, some of our favorite uh, larval, pupil, and adult patterns, and uh, this is this is seriously in depth education that uh, literally takes those eleven sessions to 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 get the information out that you and I have uh, accumulated over uh, you know almost seventy years of uh, of uh, applying still waters between the two of us. You make me feel old, Brian. You make me feel old. <laughs> But it's uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful learning experience along the way. Yeah, we're each of those sessions is probably going to be an hour and a half, two hours, depending on what it takes to cover it. Um, boat management, equipment, flies, you name it, we're going to talk about it. Uh, each session will be recorded, so students will have access to those lifetime access to those sessions. Uh, we'll be doing uh, providing pattern PDFs uh, sorry, as well and, and uh, PDFs of our uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations we're using to guide each uh, session. And uh, we're also offering something for the first 10 people to uh, jump onto this offer that uh, you and I'll provide them with uh, individual coaching sessions. Uh, we'll work that out. And this, you know, we think it's a pretty reasonable price at $189.95 uh, Canadian uh, for live presentations with Brian and I. Um, so you can book your spot through our online Stillwater store. I'm not sure if people are aware, but Brian and I, um, after, you know, struggling to find consistent access to the unique uh, flies and products and equipment and accessories we use uh, fly fishing lakes we started our own online stillwater fly fishing store you can find that at stillwaterflyfishingstore.com and if you go there and select online learning um, you'll see more course information and that's where you can pay and sign up and uh, Brian and we're going to look forward to hopefully seeing a lot of people join us because um, if they don't at least you and I can talk chronomid fishing we could talk for hours <laughs> <laughs> we'll show our secret patterns yeah so um, yeah. again, Brian, I want to thank you so much for joining me, especially on my first inaugural live uh, podcast. Um, how can people uh, get a hold of you? How can they uh, learn more about you and, and follow your escapades and on the water and continue learning through your experiences? I'm active on social media, uh, particularly on Instagram. I'm under the name at Brian Chan Fly Fishing, all one word. And as well, I'm on Facebook. You can uh you can search for me there. And I've got a website, ricewormflyfishing.com, um, where, where you can, uh, I've got articles on there and uh, and also uh, information about some uh, guiding opportunities or guiding trips that I do as well. Uh, but certainly Instagram, I'm most active and I, I'm pretty well posting uh, almost every day that I'm out on the water and uh, trying to post uh, informative some things so you can pick up some tips. I know you've been posting some pictures of uh, uh, memories from last season to uh, stimulate and get us all excited for the <laughs> upcoming season, which isn't too far away. Isn't too far away when we're today, we're uh, early February. So your lakes are going to start coming. Some of your lower elevation lakes in your neighborhood are going to be early as March, correct? Yeah, we, we if we're lucky, fingers crossed, we might see some open water early March. But certainly by the middle or third week of March, we'll, we'll have... We'll have a puddle to dip our toes in, put it that way. <laughs> oh, good. So as long as the mountain passes are clear, I can get forward. So if you have a, a knock on your door late at night, it could be me. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll get out there in our Marlin boats and have a good time. So uh, we hope everyone enjoyed listening to today's episode, learned a little bit more about coronamids and the techniques that we use to fish them, the floating line, sinking line techniques, the larval stages, pupil stages, and adult stages. It's an all-encompassing subject, and hopefully you um, you whetted your appetite and uh, perhaps join Brian and I on our upcoming course. Uh, we thank you for listening and uh, stick around uh, for uh, future episodes and uh, learn all you can about stillwater fly fishing. Brian and I hope to see you on the water someday. <laughs>